Chapter 5, Climate, Soils, and Rotation, uh, by Daniel Dean. The climate of most parts of the United States is not well suited to the production of the potato. The heat of summer is too great, and the water supply in the soil and in rainfall during the growing season is too small. It is not known what are the possibilities of the potato in the mountain regions of South America from which it was brought by white men in the 16th century. But it is certain that up to the present time, growers of northwestern Europe have often secured higher yields to the acre than those of the United States. One great reason for this fact is the difference in climate. The most famous potato growing regions of Europe are several degrees north of any part of the United States except Alaska. The average summer heat of northern Germany is estimated by the United States Department of Agriculture at nearly 10 degrees Fahrenheit lower than that of most of the potato growing sections of the United States. The climate of the principal potato growing regions of Europe is so cool that Indian corn is not grown in them. While there is heat enough for corn in most of the northern United States and even for cotton in the south. Most of northwestern Europe has very heavy rainfall because of the Gulf Stream. The potato is grown in the United States because of its high value for human food, not because of favorable conditions. These facts are emphasized because knowledge of the nature of the potato plant helps the grower to adapt his methods to his local conditions to secure the best results. Except in northern Maine and the adjoining provinces of Canada, there are few parts of America where summer heat and moisture do not limit the yield of the potato to a figure below the best possibilities of the plant. Methods which prevent the effects of these two factors result in largely increased yields. In occasional seasons, as in parts of New York in 1909 and 1914, the climate is favorable and large yields are grown. It might be possible in such years to get yields equal to those of northwestern Europe, but it would be necessary to equal their large expenses for additional labor, seed, and fertilization, and this would result in heavy loss in the other years when climate limited the yield. Hot and dry years are known in Europe, but are the exception instead of being the rule as in most of the United States. The United States Department of Agriculture yearbook for 1914 gives the average yield of potatoes to the acre for the whole United States for 10 years as being 96 bushels. While that of the state of Maine, with cool and damp climate for the same period, was 206 bushels. The figures for the countries of northwestern Europe are 311 for the Netherlands, 388 for Belgium, 210 for Great Britain and Ireland, and 200 for Germany. Yields are lower in the warmer or drier countries of Europe, being 130 in France, 115 in Hungary, and 106 in Russia. A similar contrast is marked between hot Australia, with an average of 101 bushels, and cool New Zealand, with 216, though both are settled by the same race of people. The warmest province of Canada, Ontario, averages 121 
against 207 for the cool and moist maritime provinces and 229 for British Columbia. Land is much higher in price in the potato growing regions of Europe than in America. An extreme case is on the island of Jersey, where land is worth $1,000 to $2,500 an acre. The annual rental under the tenant system common in Europe is often higher than the sale value of an acre in sections of the United States which raise millions of bushels each year. Labor is much cheaper in Europe than in America, allowing the use of very intensive hand culture at low cost. In European growers, if European growers are to secure a living profit above their high rentals, they must farm this high-priced land very intensively with large expenditure of cheap labor, seed at the rate of an average of over 37 bushels to the acre, and heavy fertilization. American agriculture has been developed in the direction of heavy production to each worker engaged rather than in that of large yield to the acre. The high price day's work is the unit not the high-priced acre of land. From the time when the Massachusetts Bay colonists went west to the Connecticut Valley in 1635, it was necessary to go westward, even to northwestern Canada, for there has been a new region of cheap land awaiting set settlement. Almost until the present time, the competition of new soil of virgin fertility has kept down the price of farm produce and of land in the older settled communities to figures far below those of Europe. An even worse effect of this competition has been that little attempt has been made to keep up soil fertility. Methods of farming suited to frontier conditions of low prices and highly fertile soil have continued in use too long. Land is now rapidly rising in price and methods of increasing the yield of crops will become more important than before. The high cost of labor in the United States compared with that of land has resulted in the invention and use of labor-saving machinery for nearly every process of farming by which the power of horses or of engines has displaced that of human muscle. Machinery cannot so much increase the production to an acre as the production to each worker engaged in farming by increasing the number of acres farmed by each. For example, the use of horse-drawn tools compels a wider spacing of potato rows, rows than where most of the work is by hand labor. This reduces the yield to the acre by reducing the number of plants. On the island of Jersey, rows of potatoes are spaced 16 inches apart and 24 to 27 inches in other parts of Europe compared with 33 to 42 inches apart in America. Factors Influencing Potato Culture Study of the factors governing the choice of methods for the culture of the potato shows that eight are of principal importance. 1. Heat in air and soil. 2. Water. 3. Soil texture. 4. Available plant food. 5. Drainage and soil air. 6. The critical period in the life of the plant. 7. Type, variety, and strain of the seed. 8. Diseases. The term limiting factor is frequently used in other connections and is peculiarly appropriate in potato growing. 
any one of the above factors may be inhibiting in some conditions and may, may be able to place a limit on the size of the crop, which cannot be removed by the others being favor favorable. For example, all farmers are familiar with the loss of yield caused by drought, although not all know that the direct effect of great heat is perhaps even more harmful than the lack of water. The results of unchecked attacks of insects, like the Colorado potato beetle, or of the late blight and rot, are other familiar examples. The potato grower, who would raise good yields every year through a series of years, must study very carefully every factor which enters into the growing of potatoes under his particular conditions, with the idea of making sure that no one condition will limit the results of his labor in other directions. Such care counts heavily in increasing the income of the farm because seasons in which a crop is generally poor from any cause are the ones in which prices are high. Heat. Numerous experiments have shown that temperatures in the soil above certain limits injure the vitality of the potato plant. The extent of the injury depends on the degree of heat and on other injurious factors as drought and insect injury. The effect varies from reduction in yield to practical failure with tubers ruined for use as seed. Potatoes are not grown in the south in midsummer. When grown in the months of late winter and spring, the vitality of the tubers for use as seed is ruined by the heat at the time the tubers mature. The second crop for seed in the south is planted in July or August and forms its tubers in the cool weather of late fall. At this time seed of good vitality is obtained. Near the Canadian line and in the Rocky Mountain region, there is little more time in the whole growing season than is needed by the late main crop varieties. When hot seasons occur there, as at Ottawa, Canada in 1906, 7, and 8, and at Greeley, Colorado in 1911, there is no way of avoiding the heat by early or late planting. In intermediate sections like those from Long Island through to Iowa, growers avoid the effects of summer heat to some extent by planting either very early or very late. Another method used more or less unconsciously by growers to prevent the effects of summer is the use of heat-resistant varieties. The McCormick or late Hoosier, is used in Virginia and Maryland in summer because of its peculiar ability to produce crops in weather too hot for any other variety. The rural, or blue sprout, type is the one which has grown more than any other in the United States. It owes much of its popularity to the fact that it will yield well in hot and dry seasons. The use of the green mountain or white sprout type is mainly confined to the cooler sections like Maine because of its inability to stand heat as well as the rural type. The Triumph, Cobbler, and early Ohio types are used to avoid extreme heat by growth in early spring rather than by heat resistance. Heat is such a decisive factor in the growth of potatoes in most of the United States that growers must ever keep its effects in mind if they are to succeed with the crop. Many of these methods of culture now used have been forced on growers unconsciously by the influence of heat on the plants on the plant. 
Much is to be expected in the future from further investigations. Straw mulches have been found very beneficial in the hot regions of the western plains to ensure coolness in the soil. It has been proved that th thorough spraying with Bordeaux mixture greatly reduces the injury from heat. This is shown by some of the gain from spraying in hot seasons when blight and insect injury are absent. A possibility is in the use of overhead irrigation in humid sections. One of the greatest needs of potato growers everywhere is a new variety possessing the table quality, yield, and appearance of those now in use together with the heat resistance of the McCormick. Water requirements. Lack of sufficient water is often a limiting factor on the yield of potatoes. Many experiments indicate that about 400 tons of water are used by the potato plant for each ton of dry matter produced, or over three tons for each bushel. This equals three inches of rainfall for each 100 bushels to the acre. Study of Weather Bureau records of rainfall shows that the average amount in the entire growing seasons in most potato growing sections is only 10 to 18 inches. The losses from runoff and from evaporation are so heavy that this factor must be provided for if exceptional yields are to be raised. Methods of conserving the soil water left by winter rains for the use of the crop are of great value. The use of ordinary surface irrigation in the west and of overhead irrigation in the east produces much heavier yields than when rainfall is the whole dependence. With these methods, yields of over 500 bushels to the acre are common. Surface tillage to prevent evaporation and the incorporation of organic matter with the soil are the principal means of conserving moisture. Plants on rich soil or when manures or fertilizers are used are able to secure their plant food from the soil by the use of less water than when grown on poor soil. Any means of extending the growth of roots makes more water available. The great need of water for the potato crop comes at the time when the tubers are forming. It is a matter of common observation that a small amount of rainfall at this time may be worth much more than larger amounts at other times. As this comes immediately after the critical period in the life of the potato, it will be seen that every effort should be made to keep the plant well supplied with water by tillage, organic matter, and the like. Soil texture. The root system of the potato is weak and small compared with that of other standard farm crops, such as corn. It is especially weak in penetrating heavy soils. In any soil, loose texture greatly favors the potato by allowing wider and deeper distribution of the roots. The development of the tubers is checked and rendered irregular unless the soil is loose and open in texture. Most of the early crop for sale in summer is grown on sandy soils. On account of their advantages in structure, potatoes would be raised only on sandy soils did they not have other disadvantages with which offset the value of good structure and earliness. Too great soil heat and lack of moisture often limit the yield of potatoes grown on sandy soils as a late main crop in summer. Much of the work of the potato grower must be directed to give heavier soil types a structure more loose and open. 
increasing the proportion of organic matter loosens up the structure of soils. Some of the greatest potato growing soils naturally possess plenty of organic matter. As the Aroostook, Aroostook, I guess that's a type of potato. As the Aroostook soils and the tool lands of California. Oh, that's a place. The increased value of irrigated soils for the potato growing where organic matter is supplied by rotation with alfalfa or the use of humus producing cover crops in the south shows the importance of organic matter. There are few American soils which are not improved for the potato by increasing their organic matter content. Under most American methods of cultivation, the proportion is reduced. Consequently, yields are gradually reduced, and in the case of some varieties, like the Burbank, even the shape of the tubers may be injured by development in the less mellow soil. Cheap and easy methods for the increase of the supply of organic matter are among the greatest needs of potato growers. Available plant food. For several reasons, the potato is less able to secure its plant food from the soil as well as many other plants unless it is in readily available condition. For example, the use of insoluble phosphoric acid in the form of raw rock phosphate often gives good results on other crops but seldom on the potato. A large supply of organic matter in the soil, good drainage, and a slightly alkaline condition are essential to the liberation of the stores of plant food in the soil for the use of plants. Fertilizers do not produce their full effect on potatoes unless these conditions are present. If the latter are favorable, fertilizers seldom fail to increase the yield. The use of fertilizers on potatoes is increasing very rapidly. In Maine, Long Island, New Jersey, and through the coast trucking section from Norfolk to Florida, over a ton to the acre is often used. The value of potatoes for human food is so high that the price received for the crop makes use, such use profitable. There is also a residual effect of the fertilizer on the succeeding crops of a rotation to be considered. Part of this effect may be due to a favorable effect of fertilizers on the soil that bacteria. Part of this effect may be due to a favorable effect of fertilizers on the soil bacteria. That's USDA Office of EXP STA Bulletin 194. <laughs> Drainage and soil air. All crops require more or less air in the soil for health and growth. The need of air in the soil is one reason why potatoes do poorly on too heavy clay soils. One reason for the ridge culture so much used on wet or heavy soils, like those of the Aroostook region and the Volusia soils region, is the need of drainage and soil air. Air is necessary to the work of bacteria in the soil and to the chemical changes which make plant food available in it. Water is necessary to plant growth, but too much in the soil is injurious. Tile drainage removes the surplus of water quickly after rains and so extends downward the area in which roots can live. Western potato growers who irrigate have learned to apply the water in furrows between the rows. The rows are ridged high enough to allow the forming tubers 
and a large part of the root system to remain above the level of the water in the furrows. The potato is very sensitive to the presence of too much water in the soil. This is shown by the quickness with which potatoes die after being covered by floods or by standing water after rains. The immersion of the tops for a few days or even hours is fatal. Too much water in the soil will kill part of the roots and greatly reduces the vitality of the plants. Critical period. The potato is now very different from the wild plant before its domestication. Then it produced few tubers and these were very small. The present varieties have been produced from the original wild stock by hundreds of years of breeding and selection to meet the demands now made upon the plant. The yield of tubers has been enormously increased above that of the wild plant. Many shapes and colors have been discarded to keep the few which suit the eyes of civilized men. The length of the life of the potato plant has been shortened from nine months or more in the wild state to only three or four months. Vast numbers of seedling varieties which may have possessed greater natural vigor have been discarded to keep those which possess these qualities. It is not surprising, therefore, that the potato plant is not a strong one. One period in its life is especially precarious. The cultivated plant now produces much less seed than the wild plant, some kind seldom or never blossoming. But blossoming is still a demand upon the strength of the potato. In the wild state, the tubers were set after the seed formation. Under domestication, the life of the plant has been shortened and the two processes overlap. When this time comes in hot weather, as with the late main crop of the northern states, the heat and drought which occurs so often make the poorest possible conditions for the potato. Insects, diseases, and careless methods of cultivation often further reduce the vitality of the crop. This has been called the critical period of the life of the potato. If it is passed in high vigor, the potato has later a more or less indeterminate growth. That is, there is no clearly defined time for its maturity, as with grain crops, but instead it gradually weakens, all the time increasing the yield of tubers. This condition occurs but seldom in the United States on account of the heat of summer, but it is an ideal towards which potato growers should strive. Production of a high degree of vitality in the growing plant in its early life and good soil conditions and care during the hot weather will carry the crop safely through heat and drought, which would not only badly reduce the yield, but also spoil the crop for use as seed. Practically the whole yield is produced after this time. Type, variety, and strain. In this chapter, reference to the seed used is made to show that the variation between different types, varieties, and strains allows the grower considerable latitude in adjusting the potato crop to different conditions. The use of quickly maturing types in the south and of heat-resistant types in all but the most northern sections are examples of these adaptions. Much effort has been expended in the effort to find new varieties possessing the quality of resistance to some of the more serious potato diseases, but with little success as yet. Diseases. Several of the most important potato diseases affect cultural methods. Examples of such are the use of long rotation to eliminate common scab. Rhizoctoneos, the nematode, eelworm, and the fusarium, wilt. 
from affected soils. Early spring planting to ensure maturity before possible attacks of late blight is employed in some sections. General types of potato growing in the United States. Conditions of climate, soil, seed, and markets vary so much that every grower has his problem to select the methods which will give him the most profitable results. The climate is something the grower cannot change. The markets have demands which the individual can do little to change. But in the selection of methods, he has wide range of choice. The great variation in the climates and soils of as large a country as the United States makes for a wide range in culture methods. Broadly speaking, most of the potato growing of the United States may be divided into five general types. 1. The early truck crop of the southern states extending to about the latitude of Washington. This belt is characterized by extreme summer heat, which prevents growth in, the su in summer, excepting that of the heat-resistant McCormick variety. The crop is grown in the cool months of winter and spring for shipment to city markets because too perishable to store in the hot summer. Most of the seed is imported from the north, or grown in the cool fall months as a second crop. Commercial fertilizers are heavily used in this belt. The summer heat does not permit growth of most of the perennial hay crops used in other sections. Annuals are mainly used for hay and for the cover crops that are often raised to prevent erosion and loss of plant food in winter owing to the higher prices for extreme earliness. Only short season early maturing varieties are used and these are usually dug immature. Less machinery is used than in other sections. 2. The northern belt of the principal potato producing states. This extends from Maine to North Dakota and down to the latitude of New York City. This belt supplies the cities and southern states during the fall and winter and competes with the southern truck crop from April to July. The climate here is cool enough for the potato to maintain its vitality in most seasons, if given good care. Early varieties are now grown, but little except for shipment south as seed stock. The use of fertilizers is steadily increasing, being very heavy in the east from Maine to New York. Spraying with Bordeaux mixture for the late blight and rot is prevalent in the east. Digging comes so near to freezing weather that the grain crops grow in rotation with potatoes are those sown in spring. Oats are used mostly with spring wheat in the Red River section. Oats and peas and barley are grown to less extent. 3. An intermediate belt between these two from Nebraska to New Jersey and Long Island. Potatoes from this belt come on city markets in summer and early fall, part being stored for winter shipment. Summer heat is not so dangerous as in the south, but there is usually an effort to avoid its effects to some degree either by planting early enough to get the crop nearly mature before midsummer, or else late enough to have much of the growth come in the cool fall months. The effect of summer heat on seed vitality is often severe, but a large share of the seed is grown locally. The use of imported seed from the north is increasing, 
particularly in the regions of more intensive culture, such as Long Island. Winter wheat and rye often follow the potato in rotation in this belt. 4. The irrigated sections of the West, destined to great extension in the future. The problems of the potato grower and other sections are here largely replaced by those peculiar to the growth of the crop under irrigation. New systems of culture have been worked out to meet the new conditions. Control of moisture has enabled some of the heaviest yields ever grown in the United States. Owing to the natural high fertility of arid soils, fertilizers are unknown. Nitrogen and organic matter are secured by rotation with alfalfa. 5. Potato growing by the so-called dry farming methods and local conditions such as the Delta section of California are as yet less important types. Soils. The choice of the soil on which to grow the potato is peculiarly difficult because of the fact that those which best meet the needs of the plant in one respect may be unfitted for it in others. Sandy soils permit free development of the root system, are well drained, and are capable of early tillage in spring. Although usually poor soils, unless fertilizer is applied, the growth of the crop is rapid, and for these reasons most of the early truck crop of the south is grown on sandy soils, as earliness secures the highest prices. The great problem of potato growing on sandy soils is that of sufficient water supply at the time the tubers are forming. This tendency to drought and heat injury of the crop has operated to lessen the use of sandy soils in the northern states for the late main crop in favor of soils cooler and more retentive of moisture. A large proportion of organic matter is of great value to sandy soils in increasing available fertility and the ability to hold moisture. The organic matter in sandy soils is easily exhausted by tillage, and constant effort is needed to keep it up to a high standard. The larger part of the potato crop of the United States is grown on soils ranging in texture from sandy or gravelly loam to clay loam. Such soils are capable of holding enough moisture to supply the growing plant continuously, are cooler than the sands, and are usually the fair fertility are usually of fair fertility if not too deficient in organic matter. While the extension of the roots and formation of the tubers are not as easy as in sandy soils, these types are not heavy enough to prevent success with the potato. Plate 8. Seed Potatoes. Top. Different Ways of Cutting. Bottom. Good and Bad Types for Seed. Clay soils are too hard and heavy for the potato. Too much water at times and poor ventilation often affect the health of potatoes on clays. Careful tillage, tile drainage, and the incorporation of organic matter lighten clay soils until they will produce good crops of potatoes in most years. Except in special cases as nearby markets, it usually pays better to grow potatoes on lighter soils and use the clay soils for crops more adapted to them, as grass. Muck soils, as the tool lands of California, often produce large yields of potatoes. The quality is likely to be poor. 
the importance of organic matter in the soil is seldom fully appreciated by American farmers. Most American soils outside of the arid regions contained more organic matter when first brought under cultivation than now. The gradual depreciation from year to year is not noticed until heavy loss in fertility has occurred. Another cause which has contributed to the depreciation of American soils is the low price of farm produce. The Department of Agriculture estimates the cash labor income of American farmers to average about $320 a year. Remember, this book was written in 1917, so this stuff is um, outdated in many ways, but still could be instructive, especially historically. All right, about $320 a year besides the items secured from the farm as house rent, garden, and the like. Too often, this condition leads to robbery of the farmer's capital, the soil. The settlement of the last free land has led to a rise of the prices of farm products, which now makes it profitable to replace and increase the lost organic matter and lime fertility of older soils. Organic matter has great power to absorb water and hold it for the use of plants. The potato is very susceptible to injury from lack of water, making this property of organic matter of great value. The physical nature of any soil is greatly changed by organic matter. Heavy soils are lightened often to a degree which ensures success instead of failure with the potato. Sandy soils are improved by their particles being bound together. The presence of abundant organic matter makes the soil more healthy as a home for plants and for the beneficial soil bacteria. Both need water and air. The plant food in the organic matter is in condition to feed the crop as fast as it decays and breaks down. Indirectly, the decay helps to dissolve the mineral plant food in the soil. Many kinds of bacteria and other microscopic forms of plant life are found in the soil. Their action and value are seldom understood by farmers. Too often the word bacteria conveys only the idea of disease, or at most that of the particular bacteria associated with legumes to take nitrogen from the air. These latter form but a fraction of the microscopic life of the soil, part of which is beneficial and part detrimental. Organic matter in and on the surface of soils is the food of many kinds of bacteria and is broken down by them to forms which plants can assimilate. The nitrogen of organic matter is changed first to ammonia and then to the soluble nitrate form. Other bacteria like Azotobacter group take nitrogen directly from the air without being associated with any particular plants. The solution of mineral plant foods is helped by some kinds of bacteria. The statement is generally true that the fertility of a soil varies according to the number of bacteria present. The number of the beneficial forms is increased by attention to maintaining the best conditions for their growth. As a large supply of organic matter for their food an alkaline soil, sufficient water, but not too much, and sufficient soil air. Organic matter in the soil is of so great importance to the potato crop that methods for maintaining its supply need careful study. In the natural wild state, the soils of humid regions receive constant additions of organic matter from the death of plants and the leaves of trees. 
the richness of newly cleared forest land and of the western prairies when first broken are examples familiar to all. Under cultivation, most crops annually produce more organic matter than do wild plants, but in most cases only a fraction is returned to the soil. Part is shipped away from the farm for the use of man or of animals. Part is destroyed by the animals fed on the farm in the process of digestion and part is lost in handling the manure. Operations of tillage and exposure of bare soils to the air rapidly use up organic matter. A few American soils are being handled in ways which increase their organic matter, but most of them probably are not. The principal method of maintaining soil organic matter is that of crop residues. All crops leave part of their organic matter in the soil after being harvested, the proportion varying greatly. When potato tops are burned to prevent disease, very little organic matter is left in the soil from the roots. Other plants have more extensive root si systems and also leave other residues in the form of stubble. A larger proportion is left when only the grain or seed of crops is removed and all stalks or straw is left on the land. Feeding off crops in the field, as in hogging down corn, leaves all the organic matter except that destroyed in the process of digestion. In practice, hay crops leave more residues than others like grain and potatoes. It is unfortunate that so little attention has been paid to hay crops in the United States compared with that given to the intertilled crops and to the grains. Tillage, manure, fertilizer, and care are too much concentrated on the other crops of a rotation and the hay is left to grow as best it can. The handling of meadows and pastures is far better understood in Europe than in America, some being hundreds of years old. The use of better seed mixtures, a better methods of seeding, a better adaption of the different hay crops to soils, and a better fertilization will not only add directly to the yield and value of hay crops, but will increase greatly the yields of the other crops of any rotation by increasing soil fertility. The statement is often made that when farm crops are fed to animals, the entire crop is returned to the soil in the manure. This is nearly true in regard to the mineral elements when the manure is well cared for but the organic matter is very largely lost in the process of digestion. Over 60% of that of hay and straw is used in this way, somewhat less in the case of grain feeds. In addition, there is the loss in the handling of the manure, while the remainder is in more quickly available condition than in straw or in stubble. The question of whether to harvest the crop to feed or to return directly to the land will depend on the profit expected from feeding. The need of the soil for organic matter, the cost of labor and the effect which either practice will have on carrying out the rotation in use. The millions of people in cities must be fed. The organic matter and mineral plant food in the produce shipped is lost to the farm. But other means can be found of replacing both. The price, the price of farm produce within easy shipping distance of cities is often greater than its value as feed for animals on the farm. Under these conditions, 
It pays to sell crops and keep up soil fertility by fertilizers, catch crops, and by attention to increasing crop residues left in the soil. Prices for farm produce are now high enough so that this can be done. The great danger which the history of American farming has shown is that the temptation to sell off cash crops too closely is so great that attention to maintaining fertility is put off too long. Animal husbandry has the advantage in practice that the return of the manure to the soil is a necessary part of farm work and soil robbery is less likely to result. The third way to return organic matter to the soil is to return the entire product of any crop. Any crop may be used for this purpose, although in practice those used are usually of low cash value. Great need of soil organic matter and increase in yield incident to such a valuable cash crop as the potato may make it advisable to plow under crops like clover, which would be inadvisable in other crop rotations of less value. The term green manure refers to crops plowed under before maturity. The term catch crop refers to one grown between crops raised for sale or feed or for other uses. The term cover crop is usually restricted to those grown to occupy the soil during the winter. In addition to supplying organic matter, any of these may cover and protect the soil and so prevent losses by erosion and leaching. A crop plowed under while still green and immature and which contains such a large proportion of water that it decays quickly may give only a small net gain over the cost of seed and planting and the amount of organic matter destroyed by tillage. Green manures must be used with caution wherever their use is likely to reduce the soil moisture for the following crop. Rye plowed under in spring is often injurious in this way. The amount of water needed for large crops of potatoes is so great that early spring plowing or surface tillage is usually advisable to save as much moisture as possible for the potatoes. Another danger from the use of any form of organic matter plowed under shortly before planting is that movement of the soil water may be hindered and the plants injured for lack of it. So much of the money value of grain crops is in the seed that it usually pays to harvest the crop. Sell or feed the grain and return the stalks or straw only to the soil. Many experiments have shown that the amount of organic matter in any crop increases most rapidly in the latter part of its life. So that in the straw of a grain crop there is likely to be found more than that in the whole crop if plowed under a few weeks before maturity. The value of the grain is several times the cost of harvesting and threshing. The use of the hay crop seeded with the small grains to plow under gives larger net returns of organic matter to the soil. Because unlike rye, buckwheat, or soybeans, there is no destruction of organic matter by tillage in planting. The need of winter cover crops for soils is least where the ground is constantly frozen or covered by snow throughout the winter. Mild and open winters, as in the south, make it desirable to have the soil covered by plants which will prevent erosion 
and save plant food which would otherwise leach away. Unless left to grow too long in spring, there is little danger in humid sections of loss of enough water to injure later money crops like potatoes. The choice of catch, cover, and green manure crops for any particular rotation, soil and climate depends on many factors which differ from those governing the choice of the money crops of the rotation only because cover crops seldom have a cash value. Those crops of any rotation which have the greatest value, as is generally the case with potatoes, naturally govern the choice of others to a great extent. The degree of its adaptability to soil and climate, ability to fit into rotation with other crops, money value, net increase or decrease in soil fertility, and cost of growing are all to be considered. Rotation. It is seldom desirable to grow the potato continuously on the same soil. The reasons for the rotation of the potato with other crops are 1. Plant diseases often rapidly become worse when crops are grown continuously. This has often been the case with the potato. Modern scientific methods of care of seed selection, disinfection, spraying, and other details of culture somewhat reduce this danger. 2. In the business management of the farm, rotation reduces the danger of excessive losses in seasons of low prices or of poor yields and arranges the work of the farm through the season to better advantage. 3. Weeds are easier controlled under a system of rotation. Those which flourish under the conditions of growth of one crop may be easily kept down under another. The high value of the potato crop pays for thorough tillage and care which cleans the soil of weeds for the rest of the rotation. 4. Insect pests are kept down easier under rotation. 5. The high cash value of potatoes justifies considerable sums of money spent on fertilizers and enables more of the time of the rotation to be used in producing organic matter to be returned later to the soil. The thorough culture late digging and winter exposure of soil after potatoes in the northern states rapidly uses up the soil organic matter. The cheapest and easiest way of replacement is by rotation with grass, clover, and other hay crops which have a money value as food for animals and also leave large amounts of organic matter in the soil from their roots and stubble, as well as that in the manure from the hay fed. Legumes are able to draw part of their nitrogen from the air to increase the soil supply. Some nitrogen is also obtained from the air in other ways, as by the non-symbiotic bacteria. This is shown by the great fertility of the wild prairie soils, which have had few leguminous plants. 6. Different plants draw on the plant food in the soil in varying proportions. Consequently, a rotation of crops enables each to secure its plant food easier than it would if grown continuously. 7. Though the potato sends its roots deeper than some crops, there are others, like clover and alfalfa, which root much deeper. These bring up fertility from the subsoil, and the roots of potatoes following are able to grow lower 
even in hard clay soils. That's from Colorado Bulletin 216. Eight, it is believed that plants throw off in the soil in their growth toxic substances which by accumulation become injurious to succeeding crops of the same plant but not to others. Um, again, this is from 1917. They probably know better about this kind of thing now. Nine, the physical conditions of the soil for succeeding crops is improved by the thorough culture given the potato. Instances of this are the use of wheat following potatoes without plowing in fall and oats without plowing in spring. The net return of the rotation as a whole must be the deciding factor in the choice of crops. The potato gives such large cash returns to the acre and responds so well to the use of fertilizers that it is usually the most important crop in the rotation in which it is grown. Wherever this is true, the choice of the other crops to grow to go with is largely governed by the, their effect on the soil for the produ production of the potato. In the northeastern states, the most common rotation is one of a tilled crop like potatoes or corn the first year, a small grain crop, usually oats or wheat, the second year, in which grass seeds are sown. In regions of the most intensive culture, this hay crop is cut only one year, and in that case, it is clover. In others, the mixture is clover and timothy with occasional red top, which is cut several years. Further south, where grasses do not grow well, it is necessary to use annual hay crops like crimson clover or cow peas. In the north, grass seeds are seldom sown alone. The practice of summer tillage before sowing alfalfa has been found so valuable that it is coming into use for the sowing of the grasses as well, particularly on weedy soils or on those on which it is difficult to get seeds sown with grain to catch. The relative profit to be expected from the growth of potatoes, grain and hay, determines the number of years which each will use in a given rotation for any locality. In New England, hay and potatoes are both relatively more valuable than grain, and each may occupy the soil for two years out of a five-year rotation. In New York and Pennsylvania, the hay may be cut for several years. Going south, hay is grown less and less until the trucking section potatoes are rotated mainly with other truck crops as spinach and cabbage. In the Middle West, the higher cost of transportation of potatoes and hay compared with grain causes the latter to be grown several years in a rotation, as is often the case in the Red River section. Hay plants. Alfalfa is the best crop to rotate with potatoes where it can be grown with profit as in the Rocky Mountain region. It is a perennial, is deep-rooted, produces several cuttings to distribute labor and risk of bad weather through a longer period. Yields heavily, is of high value for either feed or sale, gets part of its nitrogen from the air, and part of its mineral food from the deep subsoil and leaves the soil in excellent condition to grow potatoes. Its use is gradually extending in the eastern half of the United States as the methods necessary for its growth become better understood. 
it may never attain to the commanding position here which it holds in the agriculture of the western half of the country, but it is certain to become more generally grown than now. An objection to the use of alfalfa in a potato rotation in the east is that the heavy liming generally necessary induces scab on the potatoes. The hay crops usually grown in rotation with potatoes in the northern states are the clovers, timothy, and red top. Except for growing only one season, red clover has most of the good qualities of alfalfa. The growth of either is a sign of land in good condition. Both require considerable lime in the soil, though clover needs less than alfalfa. While the potato will make fair crops on land that is sour and low in organic matter, it grows better if the soil is in the well-drained and slightly alkaline condition in which the beneficial soil bacteria live best. The second cutting of common red clover is often turned under in potato rotations on account of benefit to the soil. Mammoth red clover is a larger and coarser variety of the red. Alsike clover is lighter in yield than the red, but is able to grow on many poor, wet, or sour soils where red clover will fail. It should be substituted for the red, wholly or in part, wherever there is danger that the red will fail to grow. Timothy is a hay plant of great value when handled correctly. It will grow on many soils, furnishes a fairly heavy root system and stubble to keep up soil organic matter, gives a good yield of hay which is easily cured and finds ready sale at good prices for horse feeding. The close sod formed by Timothy prevents erosion and helps to keep weeds down. The use of lime manure and fertilizers on Timothy greatly increases the yield and keeps it longer at a high production. A very common fault in the handling of Timothy is to let it stand so long that many plants die out and when the remainder are turned under, there is but little organic matter to supply seeding crops. It should be plowed while there is yet material to enrich the soil. Red top is a hay plant seldom appreciated outside of New England. A prejudice against red top in mixture in market hay reduces the price on account of a common practice of letting it stand until woody before cutting. Properly handled, its value for feeding is practically that of Timothy. By the well-known principle that a mixture of grasses yields better than either alone, red top increases the yield of mixtures in which it is included and is particularly valuable for humus production on account of its very heavy sod. It grows in soils too poor, wet or dry for Timothy. The selection of the hay plants to be grown in any rotation with potatoes should be carefully considered with the idea of building up soil fertility as well as producing hay for feeding or sale. Alfalfa, red clover, alsike clover, timothy and red top require for their growth soils varying in fertility drainage, and lime content, content in about the order named. Potatoes should be rotated with alfalfa where it succeeds. In all others, and this includes nearly all the northern and eastern states from the Red River to Maine, the capacity of the soil determines whether red clover should be sown alone. Or another mixture, this might be red and all site clover, 
the clovers with Timothy or both Timothy and Red Top, or perhaps on some of the poor Volusia soils and others of that low grade of fertility, red clover is best left out unless limed, and only all psych, Timothy, and red top sown. In southern sections, there is difficulty in growing the northern hay plants mentioned. Reliance must be placed on annuals for most of the hay and for cover-ups, called cover crops. Crimson clover, wheat, rye, winter oats, hairy vetch, soil beans, cow peas, peanuts, and velvet beans are used in the southern states for these purposes. In the west, where irrigation is practiced, alfalfa is used more than any other crop to rotate with potatoes to supply organic matter. Field peas are also used. References, Agui, Crops and Methods for Soil Improvement, Brooks, Agriculture, Volume 1, Soils, Fraser, The Potato, Grubb and Guilford, The Potato, Terry, The ABC of Potato Culture, Bulletin 87, BURPL, IND, U.S. Department Agriculture Authority for Critical Period, page 96. Bulletin 49, Canadian Central EXP Farms, Effective Heat on Seed Vitality. Bulletins 347, 352, 397, New York, Geneva, EXP, STA, and Bulletin 159, VT, EXP, STA, on effective spraying in dry season.